this morning I'd like to talk about work groups. And the reason I want to talk about work groups is because I've been getting emails from people who listen to the podcast from around the country and around the world who've been asking questions about the work and groups and their own progress and how they can be a part of a group and how they can find a group and things of that description. One email I received from a guy here in the United States, he said, I feel pulled to a group but don't want to get involved with a false cultist school, which some web pages I've visited suggest. He wanted to know if I could recommend a group. And of course, I can't recommend a group. I won't even recommend this group to anyone because it's impossible for me to recommend anything to anyone. It's something that each person has to deal with at their own level of being, in their own life, wherever they are. Not anyone who wanted to be a part of this group could be a part of this group. It's not just a matter of, well, I'd like to do that. You have to know why you would like to do that. You have to know what it is that you expect to get, what it is that you expect to give. My experience has been that most people expect to get, but they don't really expect to give. Most people are takers. Most people have not got the idea yet that this work is not free, that everything must be paid for in advance. Now, of course, it's strange with the podcast because we're giving it out freely. So people receive it freely and they don't give anything back. So how far they can go is limited right off the bat. I mean, they've got a very low ceiling right away because they're not giving anything. They're not contributing anything except their time and energy to this. And that's minimal. I mean, you have to do that to go to a concert. You have to do that to eat dinner. You have to contribute your time and energy to that. Actually, there's more that you have to do to participate in those things. So people come to this expecting everything to be free. And of course, that whole mindset of I'm going to get something for nothing, I'm going to get something for free, that whole mindset is indicative of our condition. We feel owed, that the universe owes us to be evolved. It owes us growth. It owes us a better state. It owes us a better level of being. And so all we have to do is just acknowledge that the universe owes us. And then it should do all the things that need to be done so that we can be lifted up to a new level of being and have a wonderful life, what we actually truly deserve because of our great being, our wonderfulness. And so this exalted opinion of ourselves is part of our condition. It's part of the insanity of this broken machine in which we live and that we actually think that we are. So when he asks for a recommendation, I can't really give one. He has a friend who for the 60s, 70s, and 80s was involved in the work with a couple of obviously pretty good teachers in the New York area, and his friend recommended he get involved with the group. And I think it would be a good idea. I think it's always a good idea for people to expand their work practices. And one of the best ways to expand your work practices is with other people who are also trying to do it because it creates friction. Now, friction isn't pleasant because it causes heat. And heat is great if you're really cold, but mostly that's not our problem. This kind of heat is the kind of heat that makes us uncomfortable. That's good in a work sense, but it's bad in a false personality sense because it doesn't feel good. And false personality is really interested in what feels good and what doesn't feel good. What's pleasant, what's unpleasant. It's not really interested in unpleasant things. It's not really interested in unpleasant feelings. It's interested in pleasant feelings. It's interested in pleasant sensations and pleasant thoughts. It's interested in being coddled and worshipped and adored. That's about groups. I want to address the cult thing. There are two kinds of cults. There are real cults and there are imaginary cults. Most of the cults that exist in our country today, and I think you'll find that this is an American anomaly. It's something that happens in America more than anywhere else in the world that I've ever heard about. You don't read or you don't see in the news, world news, about people like David Koresh or Jim Jones. <laughs> All of those things come out of America. Well, what is it about America that produces this? What is the culture of cults? What is it in our culture that produces this? And I think part of it is what we've already been talking about, the fact that our condition is such that we think we are owed and we think that we don't have to really do anything to get what's owed to us. 
But all we have to do is just be owed, acknowledge that we're owed, acknowledge that the universe, the world owes us a living. The world owes us something better because there are rich people in America, because there are very wealthy people in America. We feel like we're owed some of that. They should give some of that to us. You'll hear this all the time. What happens if somebody wins the lottery? They are inundated with requests to give money. All kinds of people, people who never even knew this person existed, wouldn't know him if they tripped over him lying in the gutter. But now suddenly they feel like they are owed some portion. Well, you've got so much. You should give some to me because I don't have any. That whole idea, that whole mindset is a sickness. It's a real genuine disease and it's part of our condition. And it's not just in America, but it seems to be exaggerated in America, probably because we have so much, probably because our resources are so fresh and so new compared to the rest of the world. The rest of the world has been populated for a long, long time, industrialized for a long, long time. Here, we have been exploiting our resources, but we haven't used them all up. And we're clever enough to be able to exploit other people's resources so that we're not always exploiting just our own. So, yes, we've got lots of oil here in this country. We're not using our oil. We're using other people's oil. Some of our oil is not as, it has sulfur in it, so it's not as good for the environment as if oil were good for the environment. So the sulfur is more harmful to the environment than oil that we can get from other countries. So we sell other countries our oil that has sulfur in it so that it pollutes their atmosphere, but not ours. It's the way it works. But the whole mindset is so provincial. It's so small. It's not a global mindset. We're not in this together. It's like us against them. I'm not saying it's just America. I'm saying the whole world is like this. Distinguishing between the two kinds of cults, real cults and imaginary cults, isn't really difficult if you wish to do it. If you don't wish to do it, it's impossible to distinguish between the two. You say you just have a blanket statement, they're all bad, they're all cults. The history of cults in the world is an interesting history. Christianity was a cult. The cult back then was called a sect. S-E-C-T. And so I looked up cult in the dictionary because that's always a good place to find out what the general idea is, what people in general think is the popular notion for a cult. I found two definitions, a relatively small group of people having religious beliefs or practices regarded by others as strange or sinister. So what that means is if there are more of us than you, you're a cult. If there are more of us than you and you're doing what we're not doing, you're a cult. There's something wrong with you, and we're very suspect of you. It's probably sinister what you're doing. And basically, that's an imaginary cult. That's a cult made by not anyone's action whatsoever, but someone's belief system, someone's imagination. You have those cultist schools, as it were. And this guy is asking about not getting involved in a cultist school. And I think that's great that he's aware that he needs to have good judgment. He needs to look at this consciously. He doesn't need to just find a group that says, oh, we're a fourth-way group, let's do this together. He's looking at it like, well, wait a second, that may not be the greatest idea. And he's right. It's not the greatest idea. This is a very important decision that a person makes, a very important decision, and it needs to be made as consciously as possible. Now, that's not very possible with us because we're unconscious for the most part. But we are more conscious at some times than at other times, and we can begin or try to remember ourselves, make efforts to remember ourselves, and make efforts to become more conscious, and especially make efforts to become conscious in a certain area. We can research, we can study, we can get as much knowledge as possible. And hopefully, if our intention is right, if we have a right aim, and we're making right effort, and we get right knowledge, we can come up with a decision that will be better than if we just went by automatic response, went mechanically. The nature of little mechanical eyes is to blame other people. It's not my fault. It's somebody else's fault. I didn't do this. They did it to me. Who in their right mind would choose to have this happen to them? So clearly, this is not my fault. Clearly, because I am in my right mind and I don't like what's happening to me. Clearly, then, it must be someone else's fault. See, this is all very logical to the false personality, which has a very limited perspective of the universe. It has a very limited ability to think. It thinks in very narrow, rigid avenues of expression. And it's not allowed outside of those. It thinks in either or. 
this or that, yes, no, up, down, black, white, hot, cold, good, bad. It doesn't have any way to bring a third force into it. It can only have the two forces, the opposing forces. It can't bring a third force in and neutralize anything and make a third thing, which remember we talked about yes, no. It can't do yes and no. It can only do yes or no. It just doesn't have the capacity. The small eyes do not have the capacity to understand greater ideas, larger ideas. That's one definition. And the example, obviously, is the small eyes which wish to negatively blame leaders. They did it to me. It's their fault. I didn't want this. I only wanted good things for me. And they did bad things to me. They took advantage of me and blah, 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 blah. I trusted them and they took advantage of me. And so that's one kind. Then another one is a misplaced or excessive admiration for a particular person or thing. And then the example they give is a cult of personality surrounding the leaders. And here we have small eyes which wish to positively blame leaders, not negatively blame them, but positively positively blame them. I am of the opinion, through my experience with cults in America, being called by people, a cult leader, anytime you have a small group anywhere in this country, you are automatically suspect of being a cult. See definition number one. Okay, so see definition number one, a relatively small group of people having religious beliefs or practices regarded by others as strange or sinister. Let's face it, our practices are regarded by others as strange or sinister. Meditate two hours a day. How whacked is that? You waste two hours a day when you could be watching The Sopranos? You waste two hours a day when you could be watching reality TV? What's the matter with you? You waste two hours a day when you could be on the freeway sitting in traffic? What's wrong with you? Well, what's wrong with us is we're sinister. <laughs> we're strange and sinister. That's what's wrong with us. What's wrong with us is we have rejected the world of the false personality, the outer world, the values of the outer world, for something that is not tangible, an inner world that is not tangible. This is fodder for cult accusations. And so if they don't come, it's because nobody knows you exist. <laughs> And that's impossible but because your family is going to wonder what happened to you. And they're usually the ones who cry cult the soonest. What does that really mean? They're listening to someone that's not me. That's what it really means. I don't have any power over them anymore. They're thinking because they can't think for themselves. They're too stupid for that because they need me to think for them. But now they have someone else thinking for them. And he's a bad man because he doesn't think what I want. He's not telling them to do what I want them to do. Well, that makes somebody a bad person. I mean, it really does when you think about it. It's very logical. The false personality is very logical in its limited way, and it's a limited way of thinking. But remember, logic is not what this work is about. We have to have another way of thinking. We need to mix intuition with our logic, and it gives us a greater way of thinking. Or at least that's the idea. These are examples of imaginary cults invented by little eyes, which mean no one any good. The purpose is to be right, ensuring the survival of the false personality. It's all about keeping the false personality alive and well, strong and in charge. Blaming other people keeps the heat off of me. It keeps me from ever turning inside and seeing what is wrong with me. Why is it that all these things keep happening to me? Why is it that I'm always there? In all the relationships that go wrong in the universe, I am always in the ones that I'm in. All the ones that went wrong in my life. I was always the other party there. Well, how did that happen? Well, it was just bad luck. All these people have been doing it to me all these years. And what the work says is, no, people, that you're in prison if you believe that. You subscribe to that. You are literally in prison. Well, how are you in prison? Well, you can't get out because everyone's doing it to you. You're an eternal victim. There is no way out. There is no door. There is no window. It's just a cell. And it's a cell of concrete and steel. It's a cell that you can never get out of because there is no way out. The only way out is in. You have to turn inward and find what's wrong with you inside. What is it about you that keeps on taking whatever is happening in life as this horrible thing that's happening to you? What is it that you feel owed about that people should be treating you differently than everyone else? What is it that you think that is so wonderful about you that everyone else should be bowing down to you? That's really what this is about. We don't like to hear that. It's not a pleasant thing to hear about. Gurdjieff said, Hosnamous beings don't have objective conscience. There's something in them that produces destructive impulses. 
Posthumous is a word that Gurdjieff used to explain types of people who were not nice. But he also said, we all have some hostimus in us. One of the ways that I've heard someone say it recently is, well, he's a little mean-spirited. Yes, well, aren't we all? When we don't get our way, can't we all be just a little mean-spirited? Yeah, but of course, it's not mean-spirited. It's just standing up for our rights. It's not mean-spirited at all. We, we do some mean things, but they made us do it. Since I've mentioned The Sopranos, I may as well mention that I always found it fascinating that these guys would go to kill one of their own people in the group for whatever reason, and they would get really mad at the person, and they'd be shooting them. See what you're making me do? You creep. See what you're making me do to you? I never wanted to do this, but you made me do this. And I thought, yeah, that's us. We are Sopranos, all right. You know, we all have that inside of us. We all find something else. We're mean to them. We're bad to them. But they're making us do it to them. That's insane, people. But it's that kind of insanity that runs our world. And I don't mean our world in the big sense of our world, the planet Earth. I mean our world, your world and my world, our personal worlds. And carry that out in scale to the whole world. Because let's face it, what's happening here is happening out there. And what's happening out there is happening in here. It is a microcosm and a macrocosm. I mean, we are a microcosm within the macrocosm, but also we are a macrocosm and the microcosm within us is the same as the macrocosm without, outside of us. And if that got you confused, you're, you're not paying attention because it's not difficult. A quick look on the World Wide Web produces a host of leaders who boast cosmic consciousness, enlightenment, being awake, being conscious, being super conscious. We even found an angel in a man's body. Now, I don't know who says this about these people. I don't know whether it is the people themselves telling their followers that this is what they are. My experience is that cults are made more by the people than by a leader. A leader cannot make a cult. It's impossible because a cult has to have followers, has to have people who believe something that isn't true. And why would anyone believe something that wasn't true? For their benefit. What causes a cult, in my opinion, and from my experience, is people who are using a leader to get what they want, that they can't get any other way. So they pick some charismatic bozo, because that's what leaders are. Leaders are charismatic bozos. They are. They're not very bright. If they were bright, they wouldn't be leaders, but they got the short end of the stick. And so here they are in front of the group leading. But let me ask you, anyone here ever seen a parade? OK, so you've seen the guy with the big hat and the big stick with the ball on the end and the whole uniform thing who does the whole marching thing and leads the parade, haven't you? And everyone follows him. Now, let's say that the parade route is to go down 4th Street until you get to Sycamore, and then you turn left on Sycamore. And this guy, the, what do they call that guy? Drum major. Drum major. The drum major who's leading the parade. He doesn't make a left on Sycamore. He just continues right on down 4th Street. But the rest of the parade, they all know that they've got to make a left on Sycamore, so they do. But the drum major's still going down the street, and he can still hear the music back there because they're not too far away. But then sooner or later, he can't hear the music anymore. And it's like, oh, and he turns around, and they're not there. And that's what a leader is. A leader is somebody who is a leader as long as he's going where the group is going. But the minute that he changes his mind and he decides he's not going to go where the group is going, he's no longer a leader. He's alone. So the people who make leaders are not the people who are leading. It's the people who are following. So who is responsible for a cult? How could I tell this guy how he can stay away from a cult to school? Easily. Be responsible for your own self. Be responsible for your own mind, for your own thoughts, for your own feelings, for your own life, for your own finances. Be responsible for your own belief system. Own your level of being. Own your consciousness. Oh, but it's so much easier to blame it on someone else. Yes, that's true. And that's what cults are about. Cults are about blaming it on someone else. It's like a con. No one can be conned who doesn't want something for nothing. If somebody comes to you and they say, look, I've got this watch I'll sell you. It's a Rolex. It's worth $5,000. Mm -hmm. It's pure gold. But actually, just the band is worth $5,000 today. <laughs> the watch is worth another ten. But I'll sell it to you for uh, how much have you got? <laughs> um, I'll sell it to you for uh, $85. 
because I really need the money. And it's like, what good is it going to do me? If I don't get something to eat, I'm going to die. If you know, my kids are going to die, all this horrible stuff's going to happen. And you can take it to a jeweler and he's going to tell you. In fact, my friend here is a jeweler. He'll tell you it's a, <laughs> it's a real gold Rolex and feel it, feel it. I mean, listen, and look, it keeps perfect time. Listen, it's ticking and everything. So 85 bucks in this $15,000 Rolex is yours. I'll even throw in the diamonds that are on the face for nothing. You, know? you buy the watch, you take it to a jeweler, you find out you got conned. Why did you get conned? Because you thought you were going to get something for nothing because you were taking advantage of someone else's bad situation, their misery, their suffering, their misfortune, so that you could reward yourself at someone else's expense. In other words, you wanted something for nothing. In a universe that you already know, you pay for everything. There is nothing for nothing in this universe. You don't know that. When I say you know that, I mean you intellectually grasp that. But you don't have a clue that that's true. Because you are constantly trying to get something for nothing. Your entire life is about, well, the universe owes me. Everybody owes me. You owe me. You owe me. You owe me. Our kids owe us. Our parents owe us. Our husbands owe us. Our wives owe us. The government owes us. People on the freeway owe us. They should let us out. They should not cut in front of us. They should go slow. They should go fast. They should go right. They should go left. They should buy our gas. They should wash our cars. Cars. We're insane. We're absolutely, totally, completely insane with this idea that we are owed. This is what causes cults. So when looking for a group, I don't care where you look. If your heart is right, if you have examined yourself, if you are willing and courageous enough and sincere enough and genuine enough to admit the truth about yourself and what you have observed there as if it were an interesting stranger, you don't need any, to fear any cultist schools. You don't need to fear any man. You don't need to fear anything. I'll tell you what to fear. Fear your own ignorance of yourself. Fear that because that is your worst enemy. Not the ignorance of another person. Who cares about this guy? Well, this guy, he drives a Mercedes. So? Lots of people drive Mercedes. Well, so what's he, a real estate agent? I mean, you know what? Was he a car salesman? So who cares? I don't care what he drives. What's that got to do with anything? What does he do? How does he treat you? Does he bring light to your life? Does he genuinely care about teaching you a system that he has found works or she has found works. You can determine that. This is not rocket science. You can determine that for yourself. Well, yeah, there's a little belief involved in everything we do. We have intuition, and let's face it, intuition is not measurable on a kitchen scale. You can't take intuition, well, I got this much intuition about this guy, and it certainly outweighs that. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. You've got to trust. You've got to know from experience that your intuition can be trusted, that it's not mingled with too much imagination. Notice I don't say devoid of imagination because nothing about us is devoid of imagination. Our condition is that everything about us is mixed with imagination. Everything. That's the way it is. I don't like it that way, but it is the way it is. And it's my job to tell you how it is, not how I would like it to be. And it's your job to tell you how it is. And if what I tell you doesn't go along with what you tell you, you've got a decision to make. The wise decision would be to doubt yourself, go within, and examine yourself and find out what's so. But not everybody can do that. Some people are so in bondage to pride and vanity, they cannot do that. Well, then there's nothing they can do. This work is not for everybody. A quick look at the fourth way and its founder and teachers produces people who make no such claims. Cosmic consciousness, being enlightened, awake, conscious, superconscious, angels in men's bodies. Nothing like that. You hear from the teachers, I mean the original teachers. When I say the original teachers, I mean Gurdjieff, I mean Ospensky, I mean Maurice Nicole. Those are the original teachers from my perspective. Those are the three people that I rely most upon. That doesn't mean that I don't take a little snippet from here and from there, but that's the foundation for me. That's the triad for me upon which this stands. And those people's lives could be brought under a microscope and all kinds of inconsistencies found. But one of them will not be, I'm super conscious, I'm an angel, I'm this, I'm that, I'm enlightened. None of that. What they always said is our condition, we, we, man number one, two, and three, people like us. You never heard them boasting about there is no one who has a greater consciousness than me except Jesus Christ. You never heard that from any of them, and you never will. 
You won't read it. You won't hear anybody else said it about them because it just isn't true. They understood that it's not the teacher. It's the work that the work is what guides us. <laughs> if the work were not taking the place of real conscience, then the teacher would have to take the place of real conscience. That's not how this works. In this work, the work takes the place of real conscience, the system, until you can develop, until you can find, until you can make a path to real conscience for yourself, the work stands in that stead for you. It leads you in that direction. That's the purpose. Until you can discover real I, inside of yourself, the work points you in the direction. Well, so what can the work benefit? See, a man can benefit. Well, I need a, I need a Rolls Royce, and let's see, the ghost of Gurdjieff told me that you should give me the money to buy a Rolls Royce. <laughs> okay, I guess there are people who would believe that, but what kind of people? Those kind of people don't belong in this work. In fact, they belong in a nut house where they could be like Napoleon or Cleopatra or Alexander the Great or somebody, and they could talk to Gurdjieff all the time and talk to Jesus all the time and talk to Buddha all the time and, you know, whatever. This work isn't for people like that. This work isn't for people like that. This work is for good householders, people who have made their way in life and who have said, you know, I've done it, but I don't believe in it. I've done it. I've worked in this life, and I keep my position in this life. I will do what my duty calls me to do in this life. But I'm never going to believe in this life. I'm never going to believe that it's an end in and of itself, that this is the end of it. What I believe is there's something else, something more. And I want that something more. And I'm willing to give this to get that. No. We find that, contrarily, they say our condition in terms like that. Nowhere does the fourth way say the teacher must be conscious. The light is the healer, not the teacher. Now, does that mean that the teacher can't heal? The teacher can't shed light? The no, it doesn't mean that at all. He can get it from the work, and so can you. Or she can get it from the work, and so can you. I don't want to upset anyone who has this feminist thing going on. What about he didn't say women, too? Well, fine, women, too. Frogs can do it. You know, whatever, I don't care. Really, what do I care who can do it? Anybody who steps up to the plate and pays their dues can do it. But people who just step up to the plate and say, okay, well, give it to me now. Forget it. <laughs> Forget it. Even if I want to give it to you, you can't receive it. You haven't made a place inside of yourself. You haven't made room inside of yourself. Well, how do I do that? Well, get rid of some of what you have. Pay first. Oh, well, yeah, you're just like the rest of them. <laughs> Fine. Then we have nothing to talk about. I didn't come looking for you. I haven't come and knocked on your door and asked you to come here. I put these podcasts out for people who can receive them. They're not there for other people. You know, other people can do whatever they want with them. They can judge them. They can make fun of them. They can use them as examples of what not to do. I don't care. I don't care. It doesn't matter. All that matters is that this work is made available and that people who want it have an opportunity to do something to get it, to get in touch with it, to touch it in some way, to come in contact with it. And what they do with it after that is their business, not my business. So what I have to say is verify, verify, verify. This work isn't about belief. It's about practice, effort, consciousness. You must reach a place where you can receive help. You can't just receive help because you lie on the floor in a puddle of your own sweat whining that you need help. You've got to get to the place where you can receive help. And that means you've got to do something. And you've got to do the right thing. But it's not fair. Sorry, life isn't fair. It's the way it is. It's the way it is. It's not the way we would like it to be. But that's not the way life is. Not on this planet, not in this reality. Maybe on some other planet it's different, but that's not where we are. We're here under 48 orders of law. We're here, the next to the lowest place in our ray of creation. Life isn't like that, but it should be. Well, <laughs> but it isn't. The fact that you can say it should be is proof that it isn't. The fact that you could say it could be is proof that it isn't. The fact that you can say it would be if everyone would be different is proof that it isn't. So accept your own reality. It should be, it could be, it would be. Yes, I agree. It should be, it would be nice, it could be, but it's not. So let's deal with what we've got. And this is what we've got. And it's not very nice, but it's what we've got. And it's a lot better than imagination, especially if you actually want out. So recently, emails have come asking such questions as, is it possible to teach through podcast emails and essays? Yes, I think it is. And you are the proof of that. <laughs> you are listening to this. You are learning something. You are having something in you reinforced. You are being given an opportunity to receive a knowledge that you don't get by just going to work. You don't get by working on your car. You don't get by going to a concert. This is knowledge that you don't get everywhere. Yes, it's possible for you to receive that knowledge. Yes.
What is B influence if it's not this? Is it possible to read the Bible and learn something? Yeah, it's possible. Is it possible to read the Quran and, and learn something? Yes, it's possible. Is it possible to read esoteric literature and get something out of it? Yes, it's possible. Is it possible to meditate and actually change your level of being? Yes, it's possible. Oh, wow, that's really neat. Yes, it is neat. Now you're starting to get the drift of it. Yes, it is. it's exciting, actually. To me, it's exciting. Can I progress in the fourth way, though I'm not in a group? I got this specific question. Is it possible? Gurdjieff and Ospensky and all these people say, no, it's not possible. And I don't know what context that was taken out of, but I think it is possible, and I think we need to determine how much and how far. How possible is it, and how far can you go without a group? That's really the question. The question is not, is it possible to get something without a group? Yes, it's possible. Absolutely. How far can you go without a group? Well, I don't know that. How much can you get without a group? I don't know that. How much time can you trim off by being in a group? I don't know that, but I know you can trim off time. But I know there are other people who are in a group and who will trim off no time whatsoever. They will mark time, but they will trim no time off because they'll be in the group physically, but not in the group psychologically. They'll be in the group in an outer way, but they won't be in the group in an inner way. It's not in the group in an inner way. All bets are off. So it's not a matter of your location, your physical location. It's a matter of your psychological location. Can you be connected psychologically to a group even though you're not in the same area? Well, yes, I think you can. We have a guy who comes from Denver once a month and sits in the meetings. Does he get anything out of that? Does he consider himself part of the group? Well, do you? Well, there you have it. So we have other people who listen to podcasts. Do I consider them part of the group? If they do, I do. Yes, if they do, I do. If they say, I want to be part of this group, fine. Then be part of this group. Do what we do. Observe yourself. Remember yourself. Study. Apply yourself. Practice these principles. Do the hard work. Make the effort. And we'll give you anything we have. But you already know that because you're getting this for free. Nobody's charging you for this. See, we've already learned about the giving part of this. We've already learned that in order for us to receive, we have to give. So we give first. We gave first because we know. Nobody has to convince us. We know. It's not belief. We have experience that backs it up, solid experience that backs it up. There's no question. Obviously, I think you can be part of the group. Be influences come in many forms. Why not a podcast? There are many benefits of a group, and they parallel the efforts involved in being in the group. It takes more work to practice than it does to study. It takes more effort to practice these principles than it does to study them. People can be here in this room and study and not practice. People can be in Australia or France or Belgium or the Netherlands and study and not practice. So tell me, who is going to get more benefit from this group? Someone who is in Germany or Portugal who is listening to the podcast and practicing what we're talking about or someone who's sitting in this room and studying it. Well, the person who practices it. doesn't matter where he is. He's going to get more out of it because that's the way it works. It's beautiful. This work is about changing your being through knowledge. If your being didn't change, the aim has not been met, period. If you're here and your being has not changed, the aim has not been met. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means I had a bad aim. No, 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 no. It means you took the wrong aim. The aim was fine. The target was fine. Here's the target. Your being needs to change. Your being needs to be higher. That's the target. Take aim. You got bad aim. You didn't hit it. Well, fine. Try again. What is the word that they use in the Bible for sin? The original word is missing the mark. It means missing the mark. So you take aim at the target, but you miss the mark. What do you do? Well, you go to hell and burn forever, right? <laughs> no, you try again. That's all. You try again. You say, I missed. Something's wrong in my aim. Not something's wrong with the target. The target moved. Oh, the wind blew. Oh, it's your fault. You coughed. Oh, listen to the wind. We do all of this. You know, you see somebody playing golf and they're concentrating, concentrating, concentrating in the big putt and somebody goes, bah! <laughs> And they were all, everybody's upset. Oh, everybody, they hold up little flags. Be silent. Be quiet. This guy's concentrating. Look, man, if you can't concentrate in a crowd, you can't concentrate. Hello? Concentration is an art that you develop, and you can develop it. It can get better. It can get worse.
Sometimes my concentration is great. I can do what I need to do, and anything can be going on. And sometimes everything has to be just right, or else I have no concentration at all. Well, what that really means is I have no concentration at all at that moment. That's what that really means. But I'm loath to admit that. I would much rather blame my environment. Why? Because it's part of my condition. That's why. It's part of my malady. It's part of this insane three-brained vehicle that is operating me in this life. All this is is a machine that has gotten out of control. That's what you are. That's what I am. We're machines that have gotten out of control, that have gone wild. Oh, the steering wheel doesn't work. Well, you idiot, you're holding on to the rearview mirror. <laughs> oh, oh, well, that changes everything. <laughs> yes, it does. You can move that rearview mirror around all you want. It's not going to change the direction of the vehicle. You've got to get hold of the steering wheel. Where's that? Well, first, let go of the rearview mirror. Oh, I can't let go of the rearview mirror. I'll crash. <laughs> See what I mean? It's like we're really in it. I mean, we are really in it. And so, in a sense, you've got to have a teacher who can first of all say, look, you're really in it. And what you're really in isn't real. Somebody has to introduce these ideas to you. And it's got to be somebody who has some credibility with you. They've got to have some credibility. I mean, you know, somebody walks off the street and, blah, 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 and they tell you this, like, that doesn't mean anything to you. At least I hope it doesn't. If it does, you're going to be in a cult soon. <laughs> Swe <laughs> the Swami, the Swami can predict this one, you know. Oh, wait, the Swami predicts that you're going to be in a cult soon, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I know this isn't a funny thing because there are a lot of tragic events that happen around this cult business. So it's not funny in that way. The tragedy is not funny. What is funny, though, is the tragedy. The tragedy of the fact that you're doing it to yourself. You are multiplying your own misery with your own ignorance and you're blaming it on someone else and you're driving with the rearview mirror. Let go of the rearview mirror. Oh, no, I'll crash. <laughs> You've already crashed. Let go of the rearview mirror and get hold of the steering wheel before you crash worse again and again and again and again and again and again. When I was in school, we had this speech teacher, and he gave an example one time. He was giving this talk, and he said, Why, it's as natural as a sparrow eating a worm. And a woman came to him after he gave the talk and said, Well, Dr. Fisher, sparrows don't eat worms. They're vegetarians. And he was upset because she missed the point. It was like, well, it's your job to make sure that you didn't have any fuzz on the point so that she didn't miss it. You're the one who had the fuzz on the point. She knew that sparrows didn't eat worms. You didn't. You're at fault. But he was upset with her. And so his lesson to us was, have your facts straight, because people are nitwits. Well, what I got from that was, have your facts straight, period. Have your facts straight, as straight as possible. You know, it's impossible for me to get everything exactly right. I'm human. Well, part human. I'm kind of like cyborg, you know, part human, part machine. You know? So part human. I mean, there's some human in here somewhere. It's just if you can if you can hear the human crying out over the whirring of the wheels, then you're fortunate. You know, then you've probably got some human in you, too. But actually, the truth is, is I'm part human and mostly machine. And I know this isn't good for a cult leader to say, but it's true. But this example of natural as a sparrow eating a worm is really an example of being. What the woman was saying is, look, sparrows don't eat worms. It's their being. Robins eat worms. It's part of their being. Well, but they both fly. They both have feathers. They both have two legs. They both have beaks. They both have two eyes. Yes, that's all true. But there's a difference in their being. To raise your level of being means to change what's natural to you. Oh, it's very natural to you to blame someone else right now. To change your level of being means it will no longer be natural to you to blame someone else. Wow, that could happen? Yes, I have verified that. That can happen. It doesn't happen with any regularity at first, but it does happen. In the beginning, it happens only now and again. But then after a while, it starts to happen with, with regularity. And you can start to depend on it, and you can start to say, you know, I think my being is changing. Now, if you want to go and tell everybody your being's changing, you're in for it. <laughs> <laughs> because only idiots do that. What is that about? It's all false personality. Just silly boasting of little mechanical eyes. You're, you're in for trouble because those little mechanical eyes always attract other little mechanical eyes and other people. <laughs> little biter eyes. Little nagging biter eyes. And they start biting everywhere they can. Sparrows can't eat worms. You know, the little, little mechanical <laughs> eyes. If you're going to live there, you're going to attract that. Ospensky stated it was possible for a man to evolve without a group. He said it was unlikely, but it was possible. That's enough for me because it verifies that everything doesn't have to be as rigid as the machine likes to make it. That there is some flexibility with consciousness and that the conscious circle of humanity will find a way if your heart is pure. When I say if your heart is pure, I mean if you are sincere and genuine and really willing to look at yourself, to know yourself.
The conscious circle of humanity is a group. If you can get in a place to receive help, you'll be helped by a group. Whether it's a group in Vista, California, or a group in Sydney, Australia, or a group in New York City, or a group in Lisbon, Portugal, or a group in Mannheim, Germany, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. London, England, it doesn't matter where the group is. We've already discussed this location business. What matters is, have you been able to get yourself psychologically in the place where you can receive help? No man is an island. We're all connected. The nature of higher being is sharing, compassion, love, harmony, light, balance. This is the nature of higher levels of being. Very different from our nature. Because our nature is not to share. Our nature is to hoard. Our nature is not to love. Unless, of course, we consider self-love. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I love myself. Well, fine, now love your neighbor like you love yourself. Oh, no, you're asking too much. There's not enough of that to go around. Well, and that's just it. But the higher levels of being, they understand that because they don't have all the obstructions that are down here at this level. The higher levels of being have a clearer view of how things actually are without all these obstructions, without all these buffers, filters, walls, and all the insanity that we live with that we take as normal life. You get your nose above that, things look very different. If you're fortunate enough to find someone with a higher level of being who'll teach you, take it. But understand that you will need to give first. Well, what do you need to give first? <laughs> You're going to have to give up the idea that you are the end-all, be-all in consciousness, that you are the authority in the universe, that you know everything. You're going to have to give that up. And there are not many people who can do that. There are people who can do it in certain aspects, but there are not many people who can do that. They reserve the right to veto. Well, that's not the same thing. If you're the highest level of being, you can't have a teacher. Life may be your teacher in your imagination, and if your imagination will allow it, which is unlikely. Life becomes our teacher when we get to a certain level psychologically inside of ourselves, when we can begin to know ourselves. We begin to see what we're really like. We begin to separate between who we think we are and who we actually are. And we don't know who we actually are, but we begin to find out that who we think we are is a real mess. When you stop believing in yourself, at that point, something can happen. You can't be part of a cult unless you're looking for an easier, softer way, unless you're looking for something for nothing. You can't be conned unless you're looking for something for nothing. A cult is a con, and anything can be a con if your being is low enough. And remember who makes cults. You do, not leaders. A leader is no more than a drum major leading the parade that you are. You change direction, that leader has to do what you want him to do. He's got to change direction too, or he's no longer a leader. So there's no one to blame. That takes the whole sting out of cult. Unfortunately, it takes the whole sting out of false personality's ability to blame too. So you can see which is going to go first. False personality will survive. So I can promise you that cults will survive long into the future.